ridiculously fast at some points and skip some slides. And I've also asked uh, Beth to warn me or prompt me or in, if necessary, cut me off if I'm going on too long. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk for 20 minutes or so in theory and then leave some time for questions. Uh, I'm going to start by giving you, with, giving you uh, quite a few examples and then uh, explain some of the theory and process and techniques involved. Um, these are some of the things I hope you'll take away is that uh, creativity makes your money go further. Silly PR is better than serious PR, as one client put it. Uh, a three-stage process for generating ideas and then three ways of selecting the best ideas. A um, little bit about me, yeah, I've, I've been doing this a bit over 15 years in the, mainly in the UK and North America. I started doing it, yeah, uh, in North America for the self-publishing site lulu.com and I was introduced to a PR woman in New York and she said to me, oh, uh, getting attention for self-publishing site will be very difficult. She said, uh, nowadays only two things get attention. One is celebrities and the other thing she said is weird. And I realized that was a very useful comment. I realized that what I do is weird or as I would call it quirky or offbeat or fun or amusing. And the advantage of things that are weird or quirky or offbeat is that you don't have to pay celebrities lots of money or wrangle with their agents. And celebrities are in finite supply, whereas quirky and offbeat and creative things are in infinite supply. Um, these are some of the people I've worked for, Calm, Craigslist, Badu, loads of people. Just to show you one example of, I was a journalist for many years before I started doing this, and this was, I uh, edited a magazine about museums and galleries at one point. And when we launched this, uh, we launched it by creating, um, to, it, this was really what, the you know, old terms was called a PR stunt. We launched, uh, we created the smallest museum in the world, which was inside a London telephone box. And we asked the tallest man in Britain, who was seven foot something, to come and open it. And we did this on Covent Garden Piazza, and we had TV crews from every continent in the world come and um, cover it, apart from, uh, yeah, Antarctica people pulled out at the last minute. They got, they got cold feet. Um, since then, I've been doing it for startup. This was the first startup I did it, which was um, a startup in London that was providing remote support from a call center. And we created the first call center with live hold music. So the woman in the front is working for the call center and the people at the back are a string quartet who are playing all the call center classics of uh, Four Seasons and Simply the Best and Green Sleeves and all the very other annoying ones. And we got a lot of verbal coverage for a very tiny company with not much money. Um, and uh, the next part of I did it was for a site that published uh, multimedia page turning eBooks. And they'd previously been putting out um, press releases announcing their new software, so kind of version 8.6.9.3 of their software. We couldn't understand why nobody was covering it. So I said, well, instead of telling people about your software, let's actually show them what you do by publishing an unusual book. So I, I'd recently read about a man in Serbia uh, where the national delicacy is testicles, who was one of Serbia's leading testicle chefs. And we commissioned him to write uh, the world's first testicle cookbook, which uh, subtitle was Cooking with Balls. And um, again, that got global coverage. Everyone in every country and culture understood this idea within the space of two words, testicle cookbook, and men and women, it appealed to men and women for different reasons. Um, and it got so much coverage, it crashed the, uh, the website of the company. Um, which sometimes happens is easier with small companies and big small startups and big ones. Um, this is the one, most of the examples I'm going to show you are B2C brands. This is the one example of a B2B brand. It ca this approach does work, it can work with B2B brands as well or even better because in a way it's easier to stand out because everyone is, tends to be more serious and bland. 
but this was a London-based translation company which had, uh, they offer translators in over 200 languages. But uh, what we did is that we advertised on their website and on re the Read Employment website for the world's first emoji translator. And we had a quick interactive test to t test your knowledge of emojis. And we said this was the world's first fastest growing language. And even though it was meant to be a universal uh, global language, there are actually a lot of different local um, usages and ways of interpreting. And that got huge uh, global coverage. The woman who founded the company said that after a couple of days, she was having to hide under her desk to escape the global media. This was on all four major US networks. We never even pitched it in the US, but it really went around the world. And then about three months later, when we announced that when they actually appointed the first um, global, uh, first emoji translator got a whole nother wave of global coverage. Um, and then I'm going to show you three or four examples. I've done a lot of work for Calm, the sleep and meditation app. So I, I started with them when they were nine staff in a one bedroom apartment. And then 12 months later, they were named after the year. And then they became the top gross, the world's top growth, grossing health app and the first mental health unicorn. And they came to me originally when they said, oh, we've got a very low profile. No one's heard of us. We need to raise our profile. Uh, so I did a lot of different ideas for them. This was, yeah, they were also starting slightly to pivot away from meditation. Well, meditation is still very important, but they had, uh, they had a new focus on sleep and they'd launched um, a new content strand called Sleep Stories or Bedtime Stories for Grown Ups. So a big uh, part of the brief was to get attention for these. So one of the ways we did this is that we, um, created the first bedtime story generated by AI. We collaborated uh, with a group of programmers and writers in the US who had developed a predictive text algorithm and you could feed in the text from any um, source. So we, we fed in the complete works of the Brothers Grimm and it spewed out lots and lots of text in the style of the Brothers Grimm. And then with the help of a bit of human collaboration, we created what we called uh, the first bedtime story written by AI and the first new Brothers Grimm story in over 200 years. Um, and that got yeah, over a thousand pieces of global coverage in, in 30 countries. Um, yeah, they, the, Calm was placing more and more emphasis on sleep. We, we, so we, we said, well, um, Insomnia is a global epidemic, a modern epidemic. So what would be the ultimate insomnia cure? And the answer we came up with was an eight hour slow motion film about sheep uh, standing in a field doing nothing. Um, so this was not long after the success of La La Land. So we created a poster, which was a pastiche of the La La Land poster. And we did an 80 second trailer which was kind of deadpan, but amusing. And we announced the launch of it. And again, that got a huge global coverage because it, it was again, a very simple idea that everyone in every country and every culture could understand in, in half a sentence or so. And then, um, then about three months later, we did a red carpet premiere on um, at a Western cinema where we had sheep in, um, in tuxedos and evening gowns, planting their feet in cement or in fact in mud, walking the red carpet. And again, we, we had uh, TV crews from Reuters and Associated Press. So again, that got a lot more global coverage. And then I think this is a final calm example. When the GDPR legislation uh, was uh, published and introduced in 2018, I think it was, um, I, I didn't realize initially, but actually it was a huge thing for businesses in America as well, because even though it was EU legislation, any business with uh, EU customers had to comply with it. So American businesses were getting very flustered. So we um, created a sleep story for Calm called Once Upon a GDPR. And we hired the man who used to read the shipping forecast on the BBC for 40 years to read a very long and boring extract from the 512 page document. And again, that got global coverage yeah, in the US and the UK and, and well beyond. Um, 
So this often comes under the heading of PR, under the budget line of PR, but there's lots of different jargon names for it. It's sometimes called creative PR, or viral marketing, guerrilla marketing, stunts, media neutral ideas, called viral brand building. There's two new jargon terms, one that I invented, which I, I, I think of it as sort of guerrilla content marketing, because it's using, it's often involves creating content which can then uh, be used both in traditional media and social media. And then um, the head of Calm uh, coined the term which I liked was, which was silly PR. Um, and he actually, he wrote an article at one stage which he, on some of the lessons uh, that Calm had learned uh, over the course of growing. And one of the lessons was, or he wrote, when, when he, he showed me a version of it, and it was silly PR is better than serious PR. Actually, he changed that at the last minute to a kind of blander version of the same statement, but I, I liked his original statement. And these are some of the reasons I think he was right. Silly PR gives you more buzz for your buck. You get not one piece of coverage, but 20, 50, 100, sometimes 1,000. So it lets you punch above your weight and you can outthink the big fish, if the big fish think. Um, and it helps you get not just one piece of coverage, but rolling thunder. And also, it can be a form of magic or alchemy that instead of uh, the normal relationship between PR people in, and media is that media say, uh, for God's sake, piss off and leave me alone, go away. But where, when you have a fun idea, they start chasing you and hounding you, and it, so it's, it turns the world upside down. And also, as I said, these are kind of media neutral ideas, which I think is more and more what's needed as traditional media is in sort of long-term relative decline and social media is, is the opposite. Um, so as I say, there's lots of different names for it, but I think at its heart is a simple idea, which is that creativity makes your money go further. And you, you don't need a million dollars or a, a massive budget. What you need is a good idea. A good idea will, will win you money, uh, attention that money can't buy. So what these things have in common, the ideas I've shown you is that these three things, they tend to be simple, visual, and amusing. Um, so I'm now gonna to switch to a bit of theory and show you, talk you through a three-stage process for creating ideas, which is a process that we use. So the first stage is um, you get your subject matter and you try and produce as long a list as possible as you, as you can of the cliches and the conventions and the stereotypes and the norms and the memes and the jokes and the associations, everything associated with this subject. Um, and then the next stage is you take this list and you, and you have to try and play around with these. You subvert these cliches and stereotypes and jokes. And you do that, this in three ways. The first way, or, well, three, you can do it in many ways, but I'm gonna show you stick to showing you three ways. One is to exaggerate. So you take something and you extend it to the extreme. So you extend it to the ridiculous. So for example, we did not just a small museum, but the smallest museum in the world inside a third box. Not just uh, a dull movie, but what we call the dullest movie ever made, the dullest. So we're, we're extending things to the ridiculous. Um, which is again designed to raise a smile and amuse people and get attention. Um, second technique we use a lot is what would be the opposite, so re reversal. So not the most thrilling movie ever made, but the dullest. This is the kind of equivalent of man, man bites dog. Um, Third technique is just to substitute a key element. So instead of X, which is a normal thing, what about Y? Instead of movie stars on the red carpet, what about sheep? Instead of a vegetarian cookbook, what about the testicle cookbook? Instead of a bedtime story by the Brothers Grimm, what about one by AI? And when you're substituting something, it's best to aim for the thing that you substitute to be unexpected and surprising and in Congress and out of place, but in, in a way that raises a smile and, and resonates, ideally. And the third stage is selection, which I think is in some ways the most important and the hardest uh, stage. 
Charlie Chaplin once said that genius is editing. And what I think he meant by that is that it's easy to shoot lots of film. The really hard part that takes the most skill is choosing which bits of film to use and how to fit the pieces of a film together. And I think the really hard part indeed, the, the part that takes the most skill in this process is actually selecting which ideas to progress because you inevitably only uh, executed a small proportion of the ideas you've come up with. Um, so f I think this is more or less, finally, this is a, a three, uh, three methods I use for selecting ideas. One is gut instinct, and I suppose, I guess the longer I do this, the more trained my gut instinct gets. I mean, the more expertise has gone into it. Um, the second one is kind of intellect and reason and analysis. I try and deconstruct, uh, try and identify what's going on with this idea, what are the elements and techniques and processes involved. And then the third idea is I usually ask at least half a dozen other people, colleagues, family, friends, uh, people of different ages and genders and nationalities to give their feedback. So I ask them to score them out of 10. And if they are a kind of PR media professional uh, based on their professional expertise, if they're not, it's just would they click on it or share it on social media. And then I ask them to give their quick feedbacks and comments and suggestions. Um, and it's a very helpful process. Sometimes you get consensus, which is really helpful. And sometimes you get radical disagreement, but uh, in the end you have to trust your own judgment, but this can be a really helpful thing. Uh, this is something that you can take online, which is a kind of lighthearted but reasonably useful thing. It's on the Thinking website, which is um, you can find out your fame potential score for your startup and answer the question, could your startup become famous? Um, and that's it. Okay, so I rushed through. Oh gosh, I managed in 20 minutes, or in just under 20 minutes. That's pretty amazing. I'm yeah, that was, that was very quick, Peter. Thank you. Yes, I talked to you. You're, you're not meant to speak that quickly. But <laughs> try and get it all in. We've had a, a couple of questions come through, um, Peter. Good. Um, so, Anne Brooks was wondering, should you do silly PR if your brand is more serious? Um, well, it partly depends. I was talking to um, a brand that did uh, cremations and wills, and they were up, very up for silly PR. I, I guess you, at some point you have to take a judgment about whether it's going to be offensive, is it, whether it's going to be offend people. I mean, yeah, we, we, there are always, there are often risks involved in this, and we have to consider the risks very carefully. Um, it depends on your, in, in general, I would say yes, but uh, most of the time, but not always, it depends exactly what your brand is. But I, I would say most serious brands can and should benefit from this approach, unless they really think it's going to strike completely the wrong note and offend their target users and others. But in general, I think you can get away with quirky things that are not, that don't risk offending people. I mean, I wouldn't, the testicle cookbook is not ideal for everyone, but the eight hour movie about sheep is unlikely to offend anybody. Sure. Thanks, Peter. Also, one more question. Um, a lot is online at the moment. Any recommendations on how to adapt to that? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question, but if I'm interpreting correctly, I think my main recommendation is, yes, I mean, it's, is that you need to do more of this type of stuff because it's in, incredibly difficult to stand out. Um, and um, if everything you do is straight and serious, you will get lost. And I, I've written a blog post, which I, I did have a slide on, which I didn't use, saying that there are two kinds of PR and why do most startups only use one, uh, the worst one. And I, I would call the two kinds of PR, the first kind is the kind that almost everybody does, which is conventional, traditional, straight and serious PR, 
which consists of trying to tell the world how wonderful your product or brand is. And that can work well when you're launching, if you're launching something really new and interesting and different and unique, or when you have some other exciting announcement when you when you just raised a hundred million dollars or whatever. But if you want to stand out and if you want to keep getting attention month after month, then you have to find ways to be different. And often the most cost effective way is by doing things that are quirky and offbeat and silly. So yes, I think ba the basic answer, if I'm understanding the question correctly, is to do more of this stuff. Otherwise you will, uh, you will get lost and you'll find it very hard to, to stand out. And uh, I mean, a side answer to this question and the last one, I've also written a blog post um, called what uh, Bogart, as in Humphrey Bogart, knew about marketing apps. And I think one of the things, and that's based on the fact that sometimes clients say to me, but this isn't conveying um, our perfect brand message and, uh, and all of our eight core brand values and aligned with our brand mission. And actually, I think that doesn't, to a remarkable extent, that doesn't matter. I mean, it matters when you become well known and a corporation and when most people have heard of you, then, then it starts to become important to communicate the right brand messages. But when 99.9% .9 of the world, you know, but the, the situation for most brands is that almost no one has heard of them, especially earlier stage startups. So you really the key thing is to get noticed or die and rather than to communicate your eight core brand values or die. So yes, I think you need to find ways to get noticed. Sure, uh, yes. makes sense. Um, a couple more questions just come through. So uh, would you hold back on the silly side until you've established your brand a bit? Uh, totally the opposite, no. I think you need to dial up to maximum silliness until you have established your brands. It is, um, yeah, it's like uh, what Oscar Wilde said, that uh, the only thing worse than being talked about is not being talked about. And the situation for overwhelming majority of, I think there's, I can't remember, there's something like, well, as of early, about a year ago, nine million apps in the world and i would say well over 99 percent of them never get any cover media coverage or attention so uh yeah no i th i think quite the opposite don't hold go go for maximum silliness until you have um until most people have heard of you then then you can sit down and decide when to be silly and when to be serious but when no one's heard of you, you have to do whatever it takes to make people know that you exist. Yeah, sure. Uh, one more question come through. Um, as a startup, should you secure your brand position before doing stunts around PR? Uh, no, I mean, I think that's sort of similar to the last question. No, I, I think it is about get noticed or die. The, the reason I call my blog post is what Bogart knew about marketing apps is in, in the movie Casablanca, there's a scene when Ugarte, who's the Italian refugee, uh, says to uh, Rick, the bar owner played by Bogart, he says, um, you despise me, don't you, Rick? And Bogart answers, well, if I gave you any thought, I probably would. And I think most startups are in this position of um, Bugarty, the refugee. They're very worried about what people might think about them when what they actually should be worried about the fact that nobody's thinking about them at all. One, once everybody start, is thinking about you all the time, then you can fine tune your messages. But first of all, it, you have to, uh, yeah, get noticed or die. Yeah, great. The, uh, Nikki, who asked that question, just said, uh, love that. So yeah, great answer. <laughs> um, I think that's all the questions, Peter. Thank you so much. That was that was really great. Good. Thank you. Um, lovely. So, stop sharing, do I? Yes, please. Okay, good. Lovely and, and great. Yeah, we'll just hand over to um, Sitsi now, who's our campaign specialist and uh, White Bear's account director. And she's going to be talking to us about the power of insights. 
and what they are and how you can use them to get an edge on your competitors. Actually, Beth, can I just say one final thing is that anyone should uh, punt, um, connect with me on, on LinkedIn would be a good thing. Anyway, sorry. Yeah, great. I'll, I'll put your uh, LinkedIn uh, info on the, on the chat, Peter. Yeah, great. If you like. okay. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Titsi, and I'm going to be talking to you for the next 20 minutes about insights, what they are, why they matter. I will also touch on uh, some strong insight-driven campaigns and then look at the process that we as White Bear go through when we um, interact with brands of different sizes. Um, I've been in advertising for a very long time. Um, the last job I held was with GDP. Um, and I spent a good 15 years with them. I felt like furniture there. And I've been with White Bear now for six months, haven't taken a year off to do my uh, MBA with uh, Warwick Business School. So moving along, um, and feel free to stop me, raise your hand if you've got a question and I'll answer. Um, we don't have to wait until the, the very end if it is a pressing question that you've got. Um, Something's happening, okay. Well, how do we win in a highly competitive environment when uh, competitors and yourselves equally meet consumer needs? Um, think Coke and Pepsi, um, Apple and Samsung, and the list goes on. Well, it says here that you can win through speed, first to market, second to market, you can win through innovation, are you the fastest, the sleekest, the, 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 the most stylish looking, or through emotional connection? And emotional connection here is um, a professor from the University of um, uh, California, Antonio De Mario, spoke about emotional connection and how emotions are really an ingredient that is used in decision making. Um, and um, emotions really uh, dictate preference, which at the end of the day results in uh, decision, uh, decisions that consumers make about brands. But what really is emotional connection? Emotional connection is defined in many different ways, but basically it is the alignment between the consumer and the brand. It's about what consumers and how consumers feel about your brand. But why is that important? Well, it is important because if you look at this chart here from a study, that was done by uh, the science of uh, customer emotions is that when a customer's re relationship with a brand deepens, they move along this pathway from not emotionally connected right up to fully emotionally connected. And at each step of the process, the value of the customer increases. But what we're seeing is that there is a remarkable increase in the, the, last, the last pillar where out of a sample of nine categories, it was seen that fully connected customers are 52% on average more valuable than those who are just highly satisfied. So as brand custodians, what this tells us is that we cannot be happy with just highly satisfied customers because we're leaving a lot on the table. We need to get to a point where we are really connecting with our customers and connecting on a deeper level and not just superficial level to be able to reap the, the full rewards and value of that customer. Um, this study also looked at emotional motivators that drive uh, customer behavior. And these emotional motivators were looked at across different industries and over a dozen brands. And uh, these top 10 were seen to significantly affect uh, customer value. And when you look at them, it's nothing new. It's stuff that you and I can resonate with. We want to feel secure. We want to feel a sense of freedom, succeed in life, feel a sense of belonging. And uh, the one that stood out for me here, protect the environment. I'm sure 70, 80 years ago, protect the environment would have been one of the hundred of emotional motivators uh, that the study would have found, but maybe not made it into the top 10. It's obviously made it into the top 10 because you know, we, a lot of information is available to us. We've become aware of this damage that we're causing under the environment. And as a result, we are also expecting the brands that we interact with, the brands that we buy to be socially responsible. 
And they have to be, because if they don't, then we'll make a decision to interact with other brands. We vote with our money. So what we're really seeing here is that if we come up with strategies that are not intended on uh, winning the hearts and the minds of our customers, we might actually lose them to other brands that are doing a much better job than us. How then do we get to a point where we really emotionally connect with those customers? Is it through observations or is it through insights? And this is where my talk is going to be focusing on. Observation versus insights. They're both very valuable, but the one is passive and the other is active. Observations on their own are a bit useless, but they are the starting point. An observation is something that you see. It's at face value. It is really, really obvious. But on its own, an observation is not going to point you in any direction. It is really the ladder to insights. You can observe right now that Sitsi is wearing a blue jumper, and that's as far as it goes. You're not going to emotionally connect with me just because you know I'm wearing a blue jumper. Any other person on this call can see that I'm wearing a blue jumper. What's really important is when you get to the insight, and the insight is really the motivation behind the behavior. It's the reason why, it's the unspoken truth. And the way that you get to insights is really getting under the skin of your customers, the market and the competitors. It's really coming up with something that resonates with that audience, triggers something in them, and actually makes them change their behavior. That's when you realize that you've got a really good insight. So in a nutshell, what we're saying here is that a nugget of truth, an insight is a nugget of truth about human behavior that pushes us to challenge our preconceived notions about how people act or perceive the world. They reveal to us the underlying motivations behind the behaviors. So for us to be able to emotionally connect with those customers, for us to have uh, relationships that are longer lasting, for us to be able to extract that 52% value that we saw in the previous slides, we've got to be able to understand what motivates our customers. And also looking at it, not all of the 10 motivators that I showed in the previous slide will be relevant for your brand. And for you to understand that and to find out which one really resonates with your audience, makes sense with your brand, you've got to do that research. I've got a couple of strong insight driven campaigns. They're not new. I'm sure most of them will have seen them, but I think this just helps bring it all to life. The first one here is Purcell or Omo, depending on which part of the world you're in. Back in the day, most uh, washing powders were all about whiter whites and brighter brights. It was all about the functional benefits of a product. And it became about who can shout the loudest, who really has the deep pockets, who's got more shelf space. But as you evolve and as our customers evolve and as the mot um, emotional motivators also come to the fore, our customers are demanding more from us. And as a brand, if you really want to differentiate yourself, you've got to be able to dig deep and find out what those motivations are. Dirt is good is one of those campaigns that's been running for a very, very long time. And what's interesting about this campaign is it has slightly evolved in its application as more data comes to the fore. Um, I found this very interesting as a mom of a 20 month old, that children now spend less time outdoors than a person in prison, which was really worrying for me because I'm from Africa and being in this part of the world where there's no sun, I keep my daughter inside. And when I saw this, I was like, it doesn't matter how cold it is, we will be going outside and you will be spending as much time, pick up whatever you want, because really it is about the milestones. And this whole campaign was about reclaiming children's childhood, allowing them to get dirty, because in getting dirty, they are experimenting with the world. They are finding the values that make sense, but also they are reaching those milestones that are really important to them. Unilever didn't just come up with this insight on their own. They spoke to mothers, they spoke to children. They also um, partnered with a lot of um, uh, development, child development experts to be able to really dig deep and come up with those facts that could resonate with the target audience. The second one is another Unilever um, campaign, uh, Dove, Real Beauty, really interesting. When we look at 
uh, beauty magazines, all we see is the same sort of person. Um, and it almost makes us look at ourselves and think, I'm not good enough. And really what this campaign was about is that beauty is not one dimensional. It's not a specific size or shape or color uh, or age. It's anything. And what this campaign is doing really is giving confidence back to a lot of women who feel that they're just not good enough. And in their campaign, you'll have seen this, is that they use real people. They're not using models. They're not overly retouched. Um, and again, it's just giving you that confidence. This is a brand that could have been talking about the moisturizing uh, content of their products. But again, if we go back to that 52% emotional connection, you will not be able to really connect with your consumers if all you ever talk about is the functional uh, benefits of your products. The last one I've got here is Snickers. It's really one of my favorite campaigns. You're not just, you're not you when you're hungry. And the insight was that you're a completely different person. Your behavior changes markedly when you're, when you're hungry. And this insight tapped into uh, Snickers' promise of satisfaction. And it really nicely dovetailed with that promise. And this campaign has been successfully running for about 11 years. One of their uh, first executions was with Betty White, who's one of my favorite actresses. And they have been able to evolve it quite nicely. But the one thing about this insight and this campaign, like the other two, is these are global campaigns. They're not just campaigns that only resonate with one market. They were able to tap into a universal insight that resonates globally with anybody really that interacts with this brand. And um, all three campaigns have done extremely well. They've tapped into a human insight. But most importantly is these were not short-term campaigns. They're long-term campaigns. Most of them have been running for over 10 years. Dove has been running, I think, since 2004. Uh, Snickers has been running since 2010 and it's still going strong, but it's not the same executions. There's been, you know, there's been an evolution in them, but the insight still rings true. They're simple yet bold ideas. And the last point there, which I've already uh, covered, is these are global strategies with local application. So it's not one size fits all. The Snickers campaign has run in the United Arab Emirates, in Australia, and the executions that they use uh, relevant to that target audience. The last one that I've got here is not a product, is the Ice Bucket Challenge. It's not a challenge that some global agency came up with. This was a challenge that a consumer came up with and it went viral. And yes, we could say it went viral because a lot of um, celebrities jumped onto it, but I would say it went viral because the insight just made sense. The Ice Bucket Challenge, um, the ice was made, uh, well, I suppose the, the whole insight behind this campaign was that the ice challenge simulates the, uh, the stiffness of the muscles that a person with ALS experiences. And you had the likes of Bill Gates, Oprah Winfrey taking part in this, and they were able to raise close to $200 million. This was more money than they'd ever raised before because they broadened their target audience by making it um, uh, 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 accessible and available to everybody else. But I think for me, what really stood out with this campaign, which I'm sure when it was started by, um, by Chris, uh, the, the, the golfer, was, you know, he just thought it was going to be something small, but it caught on because it resonated with a lot of people. And the money that was um, raised coming out of this challenge um, raised awareness on the illness. So a lot of people who had no clue about this illness, it really came to the fore. They came to understand about it. And when they were donating, they understood what they were putting their money behind. But most importantly is these donations were plowed back into research. And in 2015, they discovered an additional gene that affects uh, or that contributes to ALS. They broadened the target audience. And in the last five years, yes, they might not have raised the same amount as they did in the first year, but because of um, the raised awareness, there's more people now outside of the core target audience. I'm sure the people that used to all go into a hotel and try and raise money for ALS, there's now a much broader audience of people that are contributing uh, to the ALS uh, Foundation. 
So if we look at the characteristics of insights, what exactly do they do? They inspire new ideas. We can see that from uh, Dirt is Good. We can see that from um, uh, the Dove campaign. They focus on the audience more than the product or the service. And here we're talking about the children, you know, children development, reaching those milestones. It's more about the category than the brand. But then what then comes out of that campaign is people then associated with the brand. It almost becomes the generic for that brand because you've done such a good job of tapping into a human insight that resonates with the entire um, uh, category. And it's more about audience feelings than their thoughts. So in a nutshell, a great insight is unexpected, yet obvious too. When you hear it, you actually say to yourself, why didn't I think about that? It actually just makes sense. You don't have to argue because like I said before, it is an unspoken truth. When you hear it, it's like, yeah, of course, it makes sense. So what is that process? What is that process that you go through? For us as White Bear, and I'm sure a lot of other agencies out there, the process is equally as good as the outcome. Our process at White Bay is, is a three-step process. The first one is what we call the discovery and articulation. Second one is expression. And the last one is connection. Discovery and articulation is really about the brand. A lot of brands have come to us going, I want communication. I want to go out there and I want everybody to get to know me. And we go, okay, what is your brand? What do you stand for? And we find that there are a lot of gaps on that space. So we then go back and we say, this is the starting point. We need to understand what the brand stands for. And a lot of the times when we go through this exercise and we have three or five or six people from the same organization and we say, tell us, what are the benefits of the brand? And I tell you, as the number of people in the meeting is the number of benefits that we get. And they are all so different. So what we do is we sit down, we ask the questions and we ask at least seven or nine whys on each one of these, um, of these questions until we really get to the root cause of what it is you're trying to do. And the most important bit here is the brand essence. It is the heart and the soul of the brand. And a lot of stuff really evolves from the brand essence. If you think about um, uh, Volvo, for example, um, I'm sure most of you know immediately what their brand essence is. It is all about safety. And you will see that their communication, the way they talk, anything that they do revolves around that brand essence of, uh, of safety. So we ask the questions, we sit down with you. This is not a process that takes 15, 20 minutes or two hours. We really ask you the questions. And at times it sounds like we're dummifying it for you or we're treating you like kids. But if we don't get to understand who the brand is and what the brand stands for, then we won't be able to actually get to a position where we're able to express your brand in a way that makes sense, in a way that really elevates your brand to the position that you want it to be, but most importantly, how also we communicate it. A strong brand essence gives a brand authenticity, consistency, and also just relevance uh, with the target audience. The second stage is the brand expression. And here the brand expression is about the distinctive brand is, um, assets. And when you look at these assets, which is the logo, the colors, iconography, typography, when you look at these things, they need to make sense with the exercise that we would have carried out under the discovery and articulation. If the brand essence is all about uh, safety, for example, what is the logo saying? What are the colors saying? What is the typography saying? What is that tagline that brings the brand essence to life? So it is a process and really it doesn't make sense for us to start here, for example, and not having done the interrogation with the brand or to start with the communication, not having gone through this process. And the last bit is the brand connection. And here what we're talking about is how then do your consumers see your brand when we communicate it out there? And what is really important about this step is again, we go back to the brand essence, the heart and the soul of the brand. That's where it all comes from. Any brief that we have, we always ask our clients if the first stage of the exercise has already been done by somebody else, we want to see what that brand key is. 
What is your brand essence? Can you articulate it to us so that we really understand so that the communication that we come up with actually brings the brand to life? So everything starts with a brand essence. And then from there, we come up with a brand communication idea. And this is the big idea that translates the brand essence from the brand key into a communication theme. Because just saying safety is not really an exciting enough statement uh, that will come up with great creative concepts. From there, we come up with a campaign idea, which is a single-minded creative idea that plays out in all executions over a defined period of time and obviously is objective-led. And then we've got campaign um, executions. And here is an example of Coke. Coke's brand essence is share the happiness moment and the communication idea is open happiness. The campaign idea, um, they've evolved. Uh, share a Coke with um, the, the, the naming one, which I'm sure a lot of us saw, um, I think is from about 10 uh, or 12 or 15 years ago. Um, and there've been other campaign ideas that have come off, uh, but these are all campaign ideas of the brand communication idea. Um, still communicating the brand essence, which is the happiness moments, and how do you bring that to life? So this is where the process really makes sense, where you've done the, the due diligence of um, doing an audit on your brand. Uh, this is uh, where you've really asked all the right questions. Um, and the brand positioning is not just for, for startups, it is for any brand. If you're a startup, you're looking to launch a brand, we need to understand what your brand is all about. If you are an established, decades old brand that's been around for a very long time, but you're failing to connect with your target audience, then we need to do something about that brand because something is quite not right, or maybe your audience has moved on and you're still stuck behind. Um, if you're also a brand that's looking to maybe pivot and uh, attract a completely new audience, this is not something where a campaign alone can do. We need to go back to that heart and soul and really understand what that brand means. And is that still making sense if we're trying to evolve the brand from a communication point of view? I'm sure a lot of you will be saying the brands that I've used here have got deep pockets, they've got money to burn. But to be very honest, when we look at the three campaigns that I showed you, it was about the idea. So no, you don't need a million bucks to become famous. You need a good idea. And this is what Peter said, and I completely agree with Peter. It is about a good idea that gets people excited. The ice bucket challenge, I don't think would have been, uh, would have gone as viral as it did if it was really just nothing. And there wasn't a lot of money behind the ice bucket challenge. It went viral because it just made sense to a lot of people. So if we look at inspiring strategic thinking in your own offices with your colleagues, um, uh, how do you go about this? You've got to be obsessed with facts. Um, insights are not just what you're feeling. It's about the facts. You've got to be open-minded. What you discover might not sit well with you, but you're not the only consumer. You know, this is about what the majority of the consumers out there think or feel. And um, if it doesn't sit well with you, but those are the facts, then the facts are the facts. You've got to be curious. Like I said before on the brand key, we keep asking the why question so many times until we get to the root cause of why you've decided to go um, the, the way that you've, you've decided to go. You've got to be objectives. The numbers don't lie. At times, the answer is in the data, internal data, external data. Behavioral economics theories are also extremely helpful. Have a psychologist and or an anthropologist mindset. It really allows you to look at behaviors and actions a little bit different than you would if you're just looking at it from a brand point of view. Broaden your scope of reference. Consumers don't just consume one product in their life. They consume different products in their lives and each one has got a place. Each one has got a role to play but how does your brand fit into that? And how do you get to a space where you emotionally connect with your brand besides uh, beyond the, the functional benefits um, that your product offers? 
And I will leave it here with this quote from Charles Darwin that is really talking about, it's not the strongest that survive nor the most intelligent, but the ones that are most responsive to change. Um, emotional motivators are, are there, but some, some are coming more to the fore than others. We need to be aware of it. We need to get under the skin of our target audience. We need to get under the skin of the market as well as the competitors, because you could think you've got a winning formula, but your competitor could be also working on the same thing. It's about differentiating yourself, but all of this comes down to insight, really understanding what makes your consumers tick and what place or position your brand can play in the, role, in the, play, in the, in the life of your um, customers. Thank you very much. Sorry, I'm muted. Apologies. Thanks, Sitsi. Does anyone have any questions that they would like to ask? No, I think Peter's still here as well. If anyone would like to fire Peter any last minute questions as well. I know there was a few uh, late joiners on the call there. Um, if you think of anything, just feel free to pop me an email and we can, um, we can follow up um, as well. So. Um, I think a few people are asking about the uh, recording, so we'll put that on our YouTube channel and um, just send everyone a link. So if you fancy watching it again or sharing it, um, then you can do so. Um, thanks so much everyone for joining, it's great to see you all here. And, um, and yeah, hopefully see you at the next one. And thanks Peter and Zitzi, that was so interesting. I learned a lot. <laughs> thanks, bye everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye bye. Bye.